Well, good evening, friends, brothers and sisters, the small handful that are here, as well as those watching online. Anybody watching online, our materials for this service are on our Facebook page, and they were also emailed out. We do not have a formal collection tonight. Uh, you're welcome, if you want to give or tithe to the church, you're welcome to send that to the church, or you can use our online giving platform, Tithely, there's a link for that, but we're not going to have a formal collection on this Monday, or also called Holy Thursday. Nearly 2,000 years ago, on this night, Jesus had his last supper, that's where we got this gift of Holy Communion, and that's the story that we tell tonight. I have a portrait down uh, under the altar here, uh, I think I got that from one of the rooms upstairs, a depiction of the Last Supper. So this service developed through the, the worship life of the early church to retell the story of what happened in that upper room. So, so glad to have the few that are here and those online. Uh, this is Monday, Thursday, pandemic edition. So it's kind of strange for all of us. Uh, nothing that we, we hoped for, nothing that we wanted, uh, but welcome. So I'm going to read our greeting for tonight. It's responsive. Um, I will read, and you are welcome to respond. In the dark of the evening, guided by candlelight, we come to remember and give thanks. Our unison gathering prayer tonight comes from Psalm 116, that Echo will be reading for us. It's a prayer designed for us to say together on this blessed night when we are given the gift of communion, the washing of feet, and the mandate or the monday to love each other. Let's say this prayer together as we are able. Gracious God, we have been called here by your inviting spirit. As we come to worship and praise your name, we wonder, what can we bring you? In the dark of night, in the depths of our hearts, we hear your reply. Your love is all I require. So with thanksgiving and praise, we bring our whole selves with hearts full to mercy. Incline our ears to your word and open our hearts to the mystery of this holy night. Amen. Last night we had a family Zoom Christmas party for my, uh, or not Christmas party, birthday party, I should say, for my sister-in-law, Katie, and my two cute little nephews at one point kind of got into it, and one said of the other one, he touched me. So our, our opening hymn tonight, of course, referring to Jesus, is Jesus touched me, and all the joy that floods my soul. So we're going to stand as Sarah plays. Uh, we're still not supposed to sing. I'm going to sing up here because I have distance, and I think Jack will as well. So feel free for those here to follow along on our slides. 367. <laughs>
16 and John 13. In the dark of the evening, guided by the candlelight, we can come to remember and give thanks. In the soulness of this hour, guided by prayer, we come to worship, to be fed by God's Spirit, to be filled with Christ's amazing love. Our Old Testament reading is Psalms 116, 1 through 4, and 12 through 19. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompass me. The pains of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, save my life. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Our New Testament reading is found in 1 Corinthians, eleven twenty-three through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For this, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our hymn of preparation for this evening is actually an African hymn. It's called Jesu Jesu, which is a way of saying the name of Jesus. And in this particular hymn, it talks about Jesus washing the feet. Getting down, the Lord of life, Jesus Christ our Lord, kneeling at the feet of his disciples and serving them like a commoner, like a beggar, like an inferior. So we will sing, or we will stand and listen to 432 Jesu Jesu, and this is a folk song from the African country of Ghana. So let us stand as we're able.
remain standing as you're able for a reading from God's holy word. Our scripture tonight comes to us from St. John's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 1 to 17, and 31b to 35. So once again, John 13, 1 to 17. 31b to 35, every single, all four Gospels have a narrative on the Last Supper. John, uh, John's Gospel references the supper table, but gets right into the washing of the feet and the Monday. So let's hear what God's Word has to say. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that the hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into, his, into the heart of Judas, son, son, of, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come from God, and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin, and began to wash, wash the disciples' feet. He came, he came to Simon Peter, actually I lost myself, uh, and wiped them with the towel that he tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you will have no share with me. Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet, but also my hands. In my head, Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. You are clean, though not all of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. For this reason, he said, Not all of you are clean. After he washed their feet, he put on his robe, and he returned to the table. He said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set for you an example, that you should do as I have done with you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples, if you have love. For one another. Once again, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So my sermon title for tonight is called 2,000 Years Later. And no, I did not do anything 2,000 years ago. I was barely alive uh, 39 years ago, so I'm pretty young. But what we have tonight, in part, is the bread and the cup. And people that are here, people that are watching, maybe in your lifetime you have had communion hundreds or thousands of times. Maybe you've had communion more times than you can even think about or even remember. But all of it, all of it started tonight. What's amazing to me is all over the world, in all different countries, whether it's every day of the week or many Sundays, people gather at the altar, they share the bread and the cup in all different languages, and hundreds of millions of people do this every week, and all of it started tonight. If tonight ever happened, we'd have these plates and these clay cups, and we'd say, well, what do we do with these? Maybe we should have a fancy dinner, because they have a specific purpose. And what Jesus did tonight, this is during the Jewish Passover, and the Jewish Passover started in Egypt. And it started in Egypt in the book of Exodus. And on the night of the Passover, God told the Israelites who were about to leave Egypt, led by Moses through the Red Sea, what I want you to do is among your animals, find a pure and spotless lamb that's white without any blemish, a perfect lamb. And what I want you to do to this lamb is I want you to kill it and take its blood, it's kind of graphic, and smear it over your doorpost and lintels. And in doing this, 
The blood of the Lamb will protect your firstborn as you sleep tonight. You will wake up and your firstborn will be saved by the blood of the Lamb. Well, what Jesus does at this Jewish Seder dinner that I'm sure included egg, lamb, you know, because they ate the lamb, and it included bitter herbs and all that stuff, towards the end of the dinner, he did something that the disciples had never seen before. And I'm sure that they didn't fully understand. At the end of the dinner, he took bread, and then he took cup. And he told them that this bread that is broken for you is my body. And this blood that is shed for you is my blood. And through my body and blood, this will be the new covenant that's in my blood. So through me, the Passover that endured for a night, through me, Jesus is saying, that the Passover through his broken body and shed blood will be for all of eternity. What Jesus is telling his disciples is, tomorrow I am going to the cross, and I am going to break my body and shed my blood. Not for me, but for you. What I'm doing tonight at this table and what I will do in this upper room, which is the name of our daily devotional, by the way, is to show you who I am, how to love each other, and this will be a reminder of what I'm going to do for you tomorrow. And since tomorrow I'm going to give up my life for you, now you know what that means. Now in our, gospel, in our, in our reading tonight from 1 Corinthians, what the Apostle Paul says, because he was never at the Last Supper, he had only heard about this from the disciples, he said in our reading, For I received from the Lord what I handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also, after the, after the supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, I don't think these disciples really understood what he was doing. They probably just said, well, this is not the normal script for the Passover Seder. He took out bread and cup, and he said this new stuff. Judas had betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Judas scoots out to do what he does, and Jesus still gives him communion, by the way, which is one of the many reasons our communion table is open. But what they understand after Jesus' resurrection is why he did this. And what we read in the Gospels, what we read in the Scriptures, and what we know of the history of the early church, when they were together, they were regularly together, breaking bread and sharing cup. And they were doing it to remember that Christ's body was broken and his blood was shed for us on the cross. But not only that, Jesus didn't stop there. In our Gospel of John tonight, we're not told of the actual supper. It just says he was at the supper, he got up from the table, and then he did something very different that he had never done before. Jesus took off his outer robe. And the scripture says that he filled up a basin of water. And he took this water, and he began washing the disciples' feet. He poured water in a basin, and he got down and scrubbed their feet. Now, why is this significant? Normally, every year for this service, I do hand washing or foot washing. Believe it or not, probably the dirtier part of our bodies this day and age is our hands, not our feet. But most men and most women at this time wore sandals, and walking around all day, you can imagine the grime and the crud that would be on their feet. You literally could pour water on it and just see all the brown dispel, all the dirt and everything like that. So Jesus Christ, the Lord of life, the one who came to earth to live, love, and die for us is down on his hands and knees, hours away from his arrest, and right around the time of his betrayal. And tomorrow he's going to be tried, mocked, spit upon, tortured. But before he does, he gets down on his hands and knees, looks lovingly at his brothers, his disciples, and washes their feet. What would it be like to have Jesus Christ get down on his hands and knees, and wash your feet. Peter says, not me, you're not going to wash my feet. And I wonder if we wouldn't have said the same thing. If Jesus were here and he got down on his knees right now and tried to wash your feet, would you be uncomfortable with that? I know I would be. But what he was modeling was servanthood. None of us are any better than each other. 
I'm the pastor of this church. But guess what? I'm not better than any of you. And I don't think I'm necessarily the holiest person in this room. Until Melissa got me new socks, those were pretty holy. But I'm sure there's a lot of people here that are much holier than I am. We are all in ministry in the sense that Jesus Christ has called every person to be part of his church. And every person to serve in different ways. It's not just me, it's all of us together. So Jesus does this foot washing, and hand, or tonight we would do hand washing too. I'm going to display it. I know that we can't do it because of COVID. One of the most touching things that I get to do in my ministry. I remember a, a handful of years ago, the new Roman Catholic Pope, Pope Francis, went to a juvenile detention center in the city of Rome. And they took some teenagers. One of those, a couple of those teenagers were Catholic. One or two was a Muslim. And I think one was an atheist. So the Pope, the head of a church of over a billion people, gets down on his knees with all his fancy vestments on, pours water in a basin, and he starts washing the feet of these kids who are in a juvenile detention center. And what was amazing to me was to see the tears on the cheeks of these kids, Christian, Muslim, atheists. All of them were overcome that a man of his stature would humble himself to such a low level for them. But that's exactly what Jesus taught us to do. And not only did he share the bread and the cup with his brothers and say, this is representing my body and blood that will be broken and shed. This is how you treat each other. You get down on your knees and you wash their feet. You turn the other cheek. You love when it's hard. You keep going when you don't think you have anything left. And Holy Thursday, the term Holy Thursday, tends to center around the communion and the foot washing. Now, you'll notice in your bulletins it says Monday Holy Thursday. Well, how come at the Catholic Church and other churches they call it Holy Thursday, but Methodists, Episcopalians, Anglicans, we call it Monday Thursday? Well, here's why. The Latin word mandatum, uh, or in English, mandatum, translates to Monday, and Monday generally means mandate or commandment. After the bread and the cup, which was part of their Seder meal, after washing their feet, so they, they had no excuse if their feet smelled after that. And not just the way I do it, where I put a little water on. Jesus really got in there. You know, he, it was like an agitator on a, on a dishwasher or something, or on a uh, washing machine. But a little more daring than I am, because I, people have said to me, will you really scrub my feet when you do this? Not so much. I'll pour a little water on it, and I'll do that. I could do it if you really want. And I always had a couple old guys go, I'm going to run through a cow pen before I come in here. And I'm, and I'm always like, great. So after doing that, Jesus puts his robe back on and he goes, I'm not going to be here much longer. Now he told them he would be crucified and three days later he would be raised. But they didn't fully understand it. They didn't exactly know how or when it would happen. I mean, the day of crucifixion tomorrow, most of his disciples, except for John, they're gone. They've ran and they've scattered. Peter's going to deny him three times. They don't get it yet. But after doing this foot washing, Jesus says, I have one more commandment. I have one more mandate for you. And that commandment, that mandate, that, man, that mandate is that you love each other. I am leaving soon, he said. And he said to his friends and disciples, you are now my church. And as my church, I expect you to love each other the way I have loved you. And people will know who you are. What's that song we're going to sing later? They'll know we are Christians by our love. The mandate, the mandate is love each other. Love each other till it hurts. If somebody's wicked to you, still love them. That is the mandate. That is the mandate of Jesus. So on this night, nearly 2,000 years after this happened in an upper room in Jerusalem, we have Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. We're given the bread and the cup. Jesus washes the feet. And then he gives us the mandate or the mandate to love each other. This is the story we tell every year. And we have been for 2,000 years on this Monday, Holy Thursday. Amen. Amen. Well, with that said, I know in this service I do the sermon a little earlier than others. Jack is going to sing for us. And he's going to sing Watch With Me and Pray. Which takes us a little later into the evening when Jesus is in Gethsemane. Thank you for that, Jack.
so much for that, Jack. When, when you were singing that, I think of that famous painting where Jesus has his hands folded on the rock and he's looking to heaven and he's praying. Imagine knowing tomorrow you're going to be arrested, mocked, tortured, whipped, scourged, and nailed to a cross. Probably wouldn't sleep well either, would you? <laughs> so Jesus is up all night praying. So with that said, let us be in, a, in a, an attitude of prayer, and I'm going to pray for all of us. Almighty and most merciful God, we thank you for this night of Holy and Monday Thursday. We thank you that on this night in the upper room, and the term upper room is so used and so significant, your Son gave us the gift of Holy Communion, of the Lord's Supper, the bread and the cup that we share so often. He gave us the example of the washing of the feast, and he gave us a mandate to love each other. We know during this time, God, that we're still in this pandemic. We know that there's been so much suffering, but we also know that we are offered new life and new hope from you and your Son. We know tomorrow will be a day that's brutal. But we know a resurrection is coming. We know new life is coming in Sydney and on this earth as this pandemic, as this darkness will come to an end. And God, we just pray for all those who are suffering. We thank you for all the joys in our lives. And we thank you for this night almost 2,000 years ago so that we can gather together, remember and pray, and retell this story as brothers and sisters in the faith have been doing for almost 2,000 years. And God, we join together and say all these things and lift all of our voices to you as we now say the prayer that your son Jesus taught us to pray when he said, when you pray to God, pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. I think I might have put a different edition in there. It says, it says uh, debtors, but you get, you get the idea. So we always uh, tend to sing a hymn before we move into a time of Holy Communion. And I like the hymn 640. It talks about taking our bread. So we have bread here. It's something that was worked. It was something that farmers grew. It was grain taken from the field. It was produced into this loaf of bread. It's something common. It's something that many of us might have every day. But through the Holy Spirit and the love of Jesus Christ, it becomes something much more than just bread and just juice. So I'd invite you to remain seated. You don't need to stand for this, but our hymn in order in, in preparing to come to the altar of Jesus Christ is take our bread. Let us listen to this together.
communion, we have a creed, a statement of faith. Usually we say the Apostles' Creed, but on Monday, Thursday, it can be good to say something a little more robust. The Nicene Creed is also found in our United Methodist Symbol. It's very similar to the Apostles' Creed, and it's basically the basic outline of the Christian faith. One God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the creeds lay out the natures and who the nature of and what those three persons of the Godhead are and why they're significant to our life and why Jesus is at the center. So I'm going to read the Nicene Creed. And anybody here that wants to read it, if you can see it, prepare your sitting. Anybody that's watching as well, I'm going to read this centuries-old statement of the Christian faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten from the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through Him all things were made for us and our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate in the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and he was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And that is basically the basic blueprint of the Christian faith out of which most traditions of Christianity come. Now, for the prayer of confession tonight, because it's always good before we come to the table of the Lord, I know we're not going to physically come, but you get the idea. And for those at home, I know that I mentioned this in my Wednesday video, you're welcome to get some bread and juice. On your end, it would be more of what we call a love feast. But if you want to get bread and juice and be involved in this as an act of repentance and move closer to Jesus, you're welcome to do that. So what I would ask now is, in the silence of these moments, that we go before the Lord in our hearts, and we confess to God, still being in the season of Holy Lent, where we have fallen short, where we have not been loving, where we have not fulfilled that mandate, that mandate, to love each other. Let's go before God in our hearts and unburden ourselves. Well, you know, friends, what's amazing to me is that we have a God that continues to forgive us over and over and over. The same God who looks down on this world every day and sees all the pain, sees how wicked we can be to each other, watches the war, watches the fighting, watches the abuse, watches all the terrible things that goes on in this world. And tomorrow will still send his son to the cross for us. Completely boggles my mind. As wicked as we can be, and as sinful as we can be, the God of the universe wants nothing more, nothing more to, than to be in relationship with us. And he will go to the extent to make sure this is the case, to even send his very son down here to die for us. That is the great love of God in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to do a great Thanksgiving tonight, and the primary reason I don't do that on Monday or Holy Thursday is Jesus did not do a great Thanksgiving on, on Monday, Thursday. But what we have um, on this time of Holy Communion, and if we've repented, and we've turned to Christ, we should be assured that his love will cover all of our sins. So Jesus and his friends are at that Passover Seder that Jews had celebrated for centuries. They ate the lamb, they ate the egg, the bitter herbs, did some different things. 
But towards the end of the supper, Jesus did something different. It was sort of a curveball. Jesus basically said, for all these years, you have lived under the law of Moses. You lived under the rules of the Old Testament. But tonight, I'm giving you a new covenant. I'm giving you a new covenant that will be the fulfillment of everything Abraham, Moses, and all those people taught, including all the prophets. And this covenant will all be summed up in me. Through what I'm going to do and your acceptance of it, you won't be protected for a night. You will be eternally with me. And you will be covered. The blood of my, my body, Jesus said, it's not going to cover your doorpost, but it's going to cover your heart and soul. And it will cover it for eternity. That's a pretty good deal. I don't know about you or what you think. But Jesus lifted the bread to his friends and he broke it and he said, friends, this is my body broken for you. Eat of this as often as you gather in remembrance of me. And they were probably perplexed by that. They had no idea what he was talking about. And when the bread and the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, he filled it with the fruit of the vine, symbolizing his blood, and Jesus said, he lifted it to the Father and asked for blessing, he said, this, this juice, this wine in this cup, is my blood, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of this cup, remember me and do this in remembrance of me and my mighty acts. So they did that. Even Judas Iscariot, the one that betrayed him, partook of the cup and partook of the bread. So what we have, which they certainly did not do on the first last supper, was have these little communion cups. So I use the bread and I use the cup more for the part of the communion to show you. But together, because of our good friend COVID-19, we're gonna be taking communion this way. So in these little cups, there's a little wafer, which is symbolic of the bread that Jesus used. And Jesus said, this is my body, take and eat. And then you peel the next layer. I wonder what Jesus would say about this, right? And then Jesus said to his friends with the cup, Take and drink. This is my blood poured out for you. Won't you pray with me? Almighty and most merciful God, we pray that we, what we have just put in our bodies isn't merely just bread and juice. That it's something more than that. That it's something holy and powerful and spiritual. That on this Monday, Holy Thursday, brings us into the very real presence of your Son, Jesus Christ. That through this bread and juice, we might feel a special measure of your grace. That we might feel closer to Him. That we might feel closer to you. And that you might fill us and guide us through this gift that Jesus gave us this night. Of this bread and this cup, this Lord's Supper. We praise and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now what I normally do at this point in the service is I have the uh, foot and hand washing ceremony. This is my ninth time doing this, and it's the first time that I can actually do it. And every time I do this, I always have people that are before me or before others, and there are tears on their cheeks, or you can see them well up. And part of it is because of the sheer humility of what Jesus does here. So he gives them the bread and the cup. And then when the supper's over, he takes the water and he pours it in a basin. And he gets down and begins to wash the feet of the disciples. And again, imagine if Jesus did this. I would feel very uncomfortable. I'd feel very uncomfortable when you try to wash my feet. Let alone Jesus. But what Jesus does is he takes the water and he cleans the disciples' feet, including Peter, who was too, uh, too high and mighty or didn't feel worthy of Jesus doing it. And he wipes the, the feet of the disciples off. And what I normally do is when I do the wash the foot or the hand, I say to people, Jesus became a servant to his disciples to teach us to become servants to others. And then usually I say, take this towel and keep it as a gift to remember what Jesus has done for you. So as you notice in the service, we started with communion, which is what Jesus started with. And then we went to the washing, which is what Jesus did next. And next we have the sharing of the peace. And usually at this point, I remind us of the mandate or the mandate to love each other. And then we, we shake hands, we hug each other, we love you, we care about you, we're so glad you're part of our church family. 
But we can't do that tonight either because of COVID. But what we can do is we can stand and display that mandate, that commandment, that mandate that we love each other. And we can do it through waving, which is kind of nerdy. So feel free to stand as you're able. And we're going to wave to each other the love and the hope for the peace of Jesus Christ. And you can double wave if you want, or you can do the wave. You can do that. So, so our, our closing hymn tonight is they'll know we are Christians by our love. It's in the uh, Faith We Sing or the Skinny Hymnal. Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your mind, body, soul, and spirit, and treat your neighbor as yourself. He said, Upon this hangs all the law, all the teaching of the prophets. Love God, love me, and love your neighbor. That's the highest standard we can have as Christians. And I think everything he did tonight on, on Holy or Monday, Thursday in the upper room was exactly that. So we're going to stand as we're able, and we're going to hear, we'll know we are Christians by our love, and then I'll offer you a benediction.
That's the power of the church through the Holy Spirit. Well, friends, happy Monday, Holy Thursday. Be blessed in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. God, we thank you that on this night nearly 2,000 years ago, your Son, who will die for us tomorrow, gave us the gift of the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion, that he washed the feet, and that he gave us the mandate to love each other. And when we do that well and boldly, your church shines and glows and changes the world. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, tomorrow we will have a 12 p.m. Uh, Triton Ministerium meeting on Zoom. And we will be here live for Good Friday at 6. So God bless you all and have a great night.